You can join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 17. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one under the chairs nearby. And our text is on page 96 of those uh, Bibles. And let's uh, pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we receive it as what it is and what you communicate it is, which is true in all that you say. And it's good, and it is effective to accomplish your purposes. And so we pray that you would open our eyes to see your truth and beauty in Jesus, and we pray that you would change us through the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing our series in Leviticus, and we're in chapter 17 now, and this chapter focuses on the topic of blood in Israel's sacrificial system. Now, we sang this morning already a couple times about the blood of Jesus, and we'll sing it again after the sermon, and we sing in various songs that it is precious. But that could sound very strange to people who are not familiar with Jesus and the cross and what it accomplished, or with the reason why we would sing about the blood of Jesus and call it precious. I remember one time we sang the song that we sang earlier today about the, there being a fountain filled with blood. And someone said, are you sure we want to sing that? I mean, we may have like guests here who may have no idea. I mean, that is really weird. And that was helpful to recognize. We should always be thinking about how the things we say and do come across to people who have no context or understanding of what we're doing. We should always seek to explain it. And some people not only find this strange, and they have for 2,000 years, uh, but some people object to Christianity at this point because of this focus on blood. A former Christian worship leader uh, shared about this on social media last week. He was an influential songwriter uh, in Christian worship circles, and now he's critical of Christianity, and it's partly because of this talk of blood. He said that he recently went into a Christian worship service, and he was bothered by it. They were singing about how the blood of Jesus was precious. And he thought, what's with all the bloodlust? He said he used to believe this, and now he rejects it. He said, eventually, I found a bigger God than one who needed blood to forgive. So, in his view, God a God who needs the shedding of blood to forgive is a small God, and he found a bigger one. Of course, he knows what the Bible texts say about this. He said that he used to teach them, but he's decided that there are lots of different interpretations of these texts. And in his view, God loves us unconditionally, and that means he doesn't need blood to forgive us. He said, we have needed blood for the remission of our sins because we are attached to our own guilt and shame. We need a justification in our minds to forgive ourselves. God doesn't. If you can't see that, that's okay. Believe what you want. So, this raises a really important question. Why do we sing about the preciousness of Jesus' blood? What's the rationale for this? Is it right that we think of Jesus' blood as precious, or is this an embarrassment? If you're not a Christian this morning, maybe you've asked that question. So, I want to help us see why Christians think the blood of Jesus is precious enough to sing about. And the answer is found in Leviticus chapter 17. So, in our series in Leviticus, we've seen a lot of sacrifices, and we saw that in chapter 16, the one right before this, this is at the very center of the book of Leviticus. It's the Day of Atonement, which is at the center of Israel's calendar and life together. Israel's sins are forgiven. The tabernacle is cleansed for God's presence to remain with them. This all happens through the shedding of the blood of goat and a few others. But one of the challenges of reading a book like Leviticus that we've seen through this series, if you've been tracking with us, is how little rationale is given for the things God calls Israel to do. There, there's little rationale for the instructions. Lots of what, very little why. But one of 
The things that Leviticus 17 helps us do is it gives us the insight that we've been waiting for. It gives us the rationale for why these sacrifices lead to the forgiveness of sins. This chapter explains why the sacrificial system works. And so, since this sacrificial system points forward to Jesus, this explains why Jesus' death works for us. It explains why the blood of Jesus is so precious. And the key verse is right in the center. Verse 11 speaks about the blood of the sacrificial animals, and it says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And God speaking says, I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So the blood represents life, and that's how it makes atonement. Life for life, the life of the animal in the exchange of the life of the person. Atonement is about restoring us to God. And so, through Leviticus, we've been seeing that God is restoring the life that we lost in Eden, and now we see why it takes blood to get us back, because a life is given in our place so we can live. So, here's the point of the text. Since blood represents life, it's used for atonement and regarded with respect. Now, I mentioned that the very center of this chapter is verse 11, which we just read, and that's not just an observation about how it's kind of roughly in the middle of this chapter. The chapter was carefully structured to build up to this center point and then descend from it again. So, in Hebrew literature, they often used chiasms or chiasms to structure their texts. So, you can think of this text kind of like of a hill that's building to the center point and then descending from there. The whole book of Leviticus is structured this way with chapter 16 at the center. Now, chapter 17 has its own center point. Everything's building up toward that middle. And so, we see this first section ascending toward this, and then the middle section, and then the third section descends from that, and the core of the text is verse 11. It's at the heart of it. So, let's walk through the three sections. Each concerns what to do with blood. We'll summarize the three parts like this. The place the meaning, and the respect. So, the place to take the blood, the meaning of the blood, and the respect for blood. We'll read the text as we go. So, first, the place. This first section is that upward slope toward the center, and in this section, first nine verses, the focus is on the place for atonement. There's only one place to bring sacrifices. They have to be brought to God's presence in the tabernacle. So, verses 3 to 7 focus on bringing animals for peace offerings or fellowship offerings. So, we can read these verses together. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to the man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. This is to the end that the people of Israel, here's the point, may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, excuse me, and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord so that they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. So, the animals in view here are the animals that are used for offerings, an ox, a lamb, or a goat. And what seems to be in view here is the sacrificial killing of these animals. So, they are probably allowed to kill these animals on their own and eat them if they want. The word used for kill here is one that's most often used in the context of killing animals for sacrifices. Um, And so, the point seems to be that if they're going to offer an animal for a sacrifice, for a sacrificial killing, it has to be done at the tabernacle, not anywhere else. There's one location on planet Earth for sacrifices to be given at that point, and it is at the entrance of the tabernacle before the Lord. Why? And the answer is so that they would offer these to God alone. 
Idolatry was a constant problem for Israel from the very beginning. Verse 7 says that they were sacrificing in the fields to goat demons. This was probably common for some of the people that lived in this area around Israelites. And so, the Israelites are taking on these practices of their neighbors. And it's probably the case that there really were demonic beings out there in the wilderness. And demons love to lead people away from worshiping the one true God. The Bible is not silent about the reality of invisible spiritual forces in the invisible realm. I think at least some of the spiritual experiences that people have as part of the New Age movement today are probably engaging with demonic activity. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the UFO phenomena that people experience is demonic activity. We don't need to say that that stuff's just not real. It very well may be, but it doesn't mean that it's good. The Bible gives us a worldview that includes an invisible realm that messes with the visible realm. So Israel's trying to experience this spiritual realm through these demons. And God is calling them to seek Him alone, to worship Him alone, to sacrifice to Him alone. God is saying, if you want to experience spiritual reality, don't fellowship with demons. Come to me. I've spread a table. The tabernacle is my royal dwelling place. Have a feast in my presence. God's graciously inviting them to Himself. So the point is clear. There's one true God, and therefore all worship must be directed to Him. And then verses 8 and 9 says this applies even to strangers and sojourners who are among the Israelites. God doesn't make one rule for His people and then another rule for those who prefer other religions. He doesn't say that sacrifices to the fee- in the fields are really to Him, They just, it's not ideal, or they're kind of just worshiping God in their own way, directing it. They think to someone else, but all worship ends up being to the true God. That's not what's going on here. He doesn't say that the strangers and sojourners among Israel can do things how they want, but there's just this rule for Israel. Sacrifices were to be given at the tabernacle. There's one true God, and all worship's directed to Him. So what about now? Well, in John chapter 4, we hear about this conversation Jesus had with a Samaritan woman. And she, she's living among these people who worship falsely, and she asked Jesus about the location, the place of worship. Where are, they, where are they to bring their sacrifices? Is it in Jerusalem, or can it be elsewhere? Listen to Jesus' answer to her. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father? But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So, we do not go to the tabernacle or later temple anymore. We do not have to go to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice. We're not looking for a temple to be Uh, rebuilt and reinstituted with sacrifices in Jerusalem, Jesus has come, and He said, that's over. Worship is to the Father in spirit and truth. Jesus has become the true sacrifice, and He's risen, and He's poured out His Spirit to make His people become the true tabernacle, temple of God. And so, Jesus is the location of worship now, the place toward which we direct all our worship. We go to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, anywhere on the planet. Place still matters. There's one true God. We go through the sacrifice of Jesus, but the place is now this person, Jesus. So, the place, this is the place to bring blood for offerings. You bring it to God alone. Second, then, the meaning. What does the blood mean? Why is it necessary to bring blood. Verses 11 to 12 are the center and summit of the chapter. It says this, if anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. So, the clear emphasis here is the prohibition against eating blood. The idea, I mean, that might sound strange at first, like eating, wouldn't you drink not wouldn't you, no one, you wouldn't do this, but if one was to, right, you, wouldn't you drink rather than eat? Well, the idea is of eating meat that still has the blood in it. So the blood has not been properly drained from the animal, and so you're now eating the meat. Side note, this is not about kind of steaks done medium, that, that the, the red, that's uh, myoglobin, myoglobin, right? Um, that's what protein, iron, some of you are smarter in that realm than I am, but it's not blood. Um, so feel at ease there. What this is talking about, though, is uh, not draining the blood properly from the animal and therefore eating the meat with the blood still in it. Now, why is it a problem? Verse 11 is the center, the center of this central section. It's the heart of the chapter. It's the heart of the rationale for the sacrifices of atonement. So, let's walk through it phrase by phrase. First, we see the significance of blood. It says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So that's the key assumption here. The blood represents the life of the animal. So when the animal has blood coursing through its veins, it's alive. When the blood is drained, it dies. There's an obvious connection here between blood and life. But why is blood important for them? Well, next it says, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. So, the animals in view here are the animals for sacrifices, and these animals were set apart to be sacrifices for atonement. How is blood important for atonement, reconciliation to God? Well, that's the last phrase. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So, the blood represents the life of the animal. And so, when the blood is poured out, it's a picture of life being poured out. Life is leaving the animal. And it's by the life of the animal, given for the life of the worshiper, that atonement is made. So, the life of the animal is exchanged for the life of the person. So, there's a massive assumption here. The assumption is that that worshiper deserves to have life drained from him or her. They deserve to die. They should have their life poured out. And this assumption has been in the Bible ever since Genesis 3, when sin entered the world. We've sinned, and God said, in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Death is the consequence of sin. Both physical and eternal death is what we deserve. The Apostle Paul would later say the wages of sin is death. But God is graciously showing, showing us that there will be a way for atonement to be made, a way for sin to be covered, to be forgiven so that you can be with God and have life forever rather than eternal death, and it will happen through an exchange. So, in this picture in Leviticus, the animal is dying in the place of the person. The animal's life is poured out so the person's doesn't have to be. It's an exchange. This is a picture of what theologians call penal substitutionary atonement. It's an important idea. A lot of people do not like this idea, even professing Christians. It's one of the doctrines that seems to be very quickly or soon rejected by professing believers when they start moving into theological liberalism. There's often books that come out every once in a while uh, caricaturing and dismissing this doctrine. Um, and it's not the only aspect of how we understand the atonement of Jesus, but it is a central key one. So, what does it mean? Well, consider each of those three words. This is, it's penal, meaning the animal is taking the penalty or the punishment of death that the person deserves. The animal is offered, it dies, it loses its life. A penalty has been given there. It's substitutionary. The animal is taking the place of the person. So, it's standing in as a substitute. It's a substitutionary death. The animal dies, so the person lives. And thus, this is atonement. And so, the person's sins can be covered, 
or removed or hidden it's so the person can be restored to God and made one with God again. So God set up this whole system with this picture of penal substitutionary atonement to point forward to Jesus. Remember what the book of Leviticus is doing. It's showing that God is restoring the life that we lost in Eden. And we see how we'll ultimately do that through Jesus. Leviticus is here and Leviticus 17 is here so that when Jesus finally came, the categories would be there already. God's people would be able to understand what it was that Jesus was doing. And this, therefore, is one of the answers. He was giving his life as a sacrifice. His death was a penal substitutionary atonement. He died the death we deserve to die so we can enjoy the eternal life he's happy to share. And this is the only means of atonement. Remember, there's only one place to bring the offering. And this pointed to the one place of atonement in human history, which is the cross of Jesus. So maybe you've wondered why Christians believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And it's because the cross is the only solution to our deepest problem. We need a substitute to take our place. We don't just need tips or a pathway or steps to eternal life or enlightenment. We need a death in our place if we're going to live. So this is the peak of the mountain of the text, and it looks ahead to the peak of the little hill that Jesus died on, the Mount of Crucifixion. So verse 11 is explaining ahead of time what would be going on at the cross. So now we descend from here to the last part of the chapter. It takes what we just saw and teaches us to treat all blood with respect. So third, respect. So far, God gave instruction about the blood of the animals that are used for sacrifices. That's been the focus. But what about other animals? How should Israel treat them, especially related to killing and eating them? The principle that we just saw at the center of the text has implications here. So the principle is that there's life in the blood, right? Blood represents life. And since God is the creator of all things, he's the giver of all life, Blood is to be respected. Life is to be respected. We're to treat all life with dignity and care. So, if you're an Israelite and you're hunting in order to eat, which is fine and good, what do they do with that animal? Verses 13 to 14 show us. Anyone also of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who takes in hunting... Any beast or bird that may be eaten shall pour out its blood and cover the earth with it. For the life of every creature is its blood. There's the principle again. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I've said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature. For the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So there too drain the blood from the animal before eating it. And it seems like there's a tone of respect and carefulness here. They're to pour it out on the ground and cover it over with earth. So the purpose is not atonement here, but there's still a sense in which the animal is giving its life for the person, right? When they kill an animal to eat it, that animal is giving its life for the sustenance of the person. Thanksgiving is coming up. Many of you will sit around a table with a turkey in the middle of that table. What's going on there? Well, it is a picture of substitution. That turkey gave up its life so that you could eat it and keep living. So whenever you thank God for that meal, or any meal where a life was given for you to be able to eat and continue living. It's a sobering reality. We thank God for this, but it was, a, it was a real life, and it was given. And so it's to be respected because God gave that animal life. It's okay to eat it according to Scripture, but we do it with thankfulness. We recognize that there was a real cost, and so we do this then with thanksgiving uh, in a sober recognition of what it takes for us to live, um, not only Thanksgiving, but any meal that involves the giving of life. We're often so removed from the process of 
producing food, right, that we can miss this. But in most cultures, they raise the animals, they know the animals, the life of the animal is clearly given for the people to keep living, and so we should remember this and not be flippant about it. And there's implications here for how we're to honor all life. This is part of the rationale for the Christian view that all life is sacred because God's the giver of life. We believe in the sanctity of all human life, beginning in the womb, all the way to death, We also believe that animal life is a precious gift of God. So God created humanity and set them above the animal world. So we're not on the same level. Humans are not just evolved animals. So there's no um, just mere sacredness for human life and not animal life. We're stewards of God's creation. We honor all life. So this means that there's two extremes to avoid. On one side is PETA, which wants animals to share in human rights. On the other side is much of our modern disregard for animal life. There's a Christian impulse, though, that should lead us to work for the kind treatment of animals. I had a coworker for a summer job um, who got this wrong. He had grown up in Africa, and he had access to all sorts of wildlife. And so he was showing, he wanted to show me a video Um, that he thought was just hilarious. And so he had filmed it of he and his friends on dirt bikes chasing a gazelle. And they had been shooting the gazelle, I think, with like BB guns. So the, the, the gazelle's frightened. They're cornering it. It's just, it's a bloody, frightened mess. And this guy and his friends are just yelling with wild laughter, just having a ball. That is dishonoring the life that God gave. And there's indications all through the Bible how we should treat all life, including animal life. God created the animals in the beginning and said it was good. The last verse in the book of Jonah has always stood out to me. So God's going to destroy the people of Jonah or of Nineveh unless they repent. Jonah doesn't want them to be spared. And God says to Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? God pities the cattle that would also be destroyed in the wake of the judgment. Proverbs 12.10 says, Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. So we look forward to the new creation when wolf will lie down with the lamb. Martin Luther once said that right now when that happens, only one of them is going to get up again. Uh, But we look forward to the day when they'll lie down in peace and we respect God's creation. So let's return now to the question we started with. Why do Christians sing about the preciousness of Jesus' blood? And it's because of verse 11. His blood is precious because it represents his life. And he gave his life for ours. His blood made atonement for our sins. And so this is why the New Testament refers to the blood of Jesus so much. You can search for it. It's repeated over and over and over. The blood of Jesus. So here's why the blood of Jesus is precious According to the New Testament, here's, I think, just nine places in the New Testament that refer to it. There's more. It's precious because it was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. It's precious because it shows that God is just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. So he's just, meaning he doesn't just sweep sin under the rug, dismiss it as if it's no big deal in order to forgive. No, he upholds his justice while also declaring righteous and justifying sinners. Romans 3.25 says, Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It's precious because we are 
therefore justified by his blood. Romans 5, 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. It's precious because we have redemption through his blood. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's precious because Jesus made peace by his blood. Colossians 1.20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, God making peace by the blood of his cross. It's precious because it purifies our consciences and secures an eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.12, he entered, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, all right, according to Leviticus, but in the fulfillment by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. It's precious because it cleanses us from all sin, not just once, but ongoing day by day as a Christian. We bring our sins, and there's always forgiveness. There is fresh cleansing, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's precious because by his blood, he ransomed, he purchased people for God. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song. So here's the singing saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And it's precious because it ransomed us from a futile, empty life. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. And this is where we get the phrase, the preciousness of Jesus' blood. We get it from Peter himself. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So that's why we view the blood of Jesus as precious. This is not about a, and this is how the caricature goes when people want to dismiss this, this is not about a trigger-happy God who's against us, but then there's a loving Savior, Jesus, who kind of steps in and calms the angry father down, compelling him to change his mind. No, this is God's idea. God rightly recoils at sin because of his holiness. He rightly judges and punishes sin because of his justice. We are rightly under the sentence of physical and eternal death because of our sins, but God himself also loves us deeply. And his love and mercy led him to produce a way for us to be restored to him at great personal cost to himself. So the cross doesn't mean that the Father is against us and the Son is for us and the Son kind of persuades the Father to be for us. No, it means that the Father and Son are both for us. They they are rightly against us in our sin, but they planned for the Son to be a sacrifice of atonement, to give His life for us so they can be only, always, and ever and eternally for us. It's God's idea. So we trust in Jesus and his blood, and we sing about it as precious. And if you don't view Jesus as precious yet, we pray that you'd reflect on this today and consider why it is that the blood of Jesus could be considered precious and how it might be precious for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Without that, Lord, uh, we would have no hope. And so we're so thankful that this is how you showed yourself to be just and the one who declares righteous sinners. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving your life. Amen.